Hello everyone, and finally I'm here, and thank you Vance for inviting me to um, come here and share with you my experience. So I start now with the outline um, slide, the second one. Mm -hmm. so, so today I'm going to, talk a, to give you a theoretical background and talk about the principles of the silent way, and then why I chose the silent way, some questions and challenges I had, and then I'll tell you about my silent way lesson, and then students' feedback, observations, and some new lessons I had from this experience and the limitations of this um, approach. So the next slide, I'm going to start with the background. So this approach was started by Caleb Gettigno. And what's interesting is that Caleb was born in Alexandria in Egypt. And um, he started this approach um, in teaching mathematics. And this is what I'm going to tell you later, how um, it moved to English language teaching. So it started in the 70s, and it's mainly uh, to promote interdependence and autonomy and responsibility among the learners, which is what we are all looking for as English language teachers. So the next slide, I'll start with the first principle of uh, the silent way, which is that teaching is subordinate to learning. So the teacher raises the student's awareness. This is the only job of the teacher, to raise the student's awareness that there is knowledge there to be gained, rather than just supply them with the knowledge and ready to get it to them readily. But they have to uh, look for the way they can gain this knowledge. So that's why it fosters the learner's autonomy, encourages them to be independent from the teacher. So they get engaged in a problem-solving process until they learn the new language or the new content, rather than just being passive learners. The next principle is that the teacher's silence is a pedagogical tool because the teacher doesn't actually talk, so we minimize the direct input by the teacher because the teacher would just use gestures and mime, among other tools, of course. So we force the learners to be alert and correct each other's errors because the teacher is not talking, so they will have to find the correct version or, or correct themselves among each other so we force them to be alert all the time and correct each other's errors. And it also allows the teacher, who is silent most of the time, to observe the students and learn more about their needs, their weaknesses, strengths, and learning styles. So the last principle, or the third one, is that learning can be facilitated by some visual and physical objects. And the first one suggested in the silent way by, by Caleb is the sound chart. As you can see, it's a chart that has uh, some colors, and these colors represent the sounds of the language. So you just point at the color and sh tell them that this is the sh, or this is the wa, and so on. And then by the end, when they have learned all the colors, which is actually all the sounds, you can point to four colors to form a word of four sounds and so on. So this chart is mainly for pronunciation. The next tool is word charts. And these are, in English, we have eight word charts with, the, let's say, high frequency words and articles and prepositions. And even sometimes, as you can see, you have the S of the plural or the articles A, N, and so on. So we have eight for the English language. And there are also some word charts for other languages. So if you're teaching French or other languages, you can find some of these word charts for other languages. And another tool, which is the most interesting, um, in my opinion, is the Cuisinart rods. And let's see how many of you are familiar with them. So if you are familiar with them, just write yes in the chat. I can see the chat. OK. So have you used them before? So let's also type yes or no. So those people who, are, who know them, have you used them? Yes? Good. OK. Because actually, these were always there in our teacher's room. But many of the teachers don't know what are these and what do we do with them. So the quiz and rods are very, very interesting tools that we can use, not just uh, applying the silent way, but in lots of other stuff. 
So I was very happy to know what is this nice box full of wooden rods in different sizes and different colors, and how can we use them in teaching. There are actually 10 different sizes and colors of wooden rods, as you can see them. So the next slide will show you how Caleb started the Cuisinart rods in teaching mathematics. So as you can see in the first picture on the top right, that he has each rod representing a number from the smallest one to the biggest, the 10. And then the next picture, they use it with students when they start adding numbers. So we put two rods for one plus one, they get two, and so on. This is how it started in mathematics. And then it moved on to teaching English. So why the silent way? The next slide is that it was part of a teacher training program that we had. Um, it's a year training program for teachers, and we have to end this year with a final project, applying one of the teaching approaches to our classes. So it was an experimental practice project for me. I chose the silent way because it goes beyond the teacher and the student expectations. It's not the usual traditional classroom that we have. And I also wanted to do something for my low-level students and to experiment how can I help them using this way. And I also found that it's game-like, so it's rods, pictures, colors, so it's like we're playing a game, a colorful game, which is really nice. So I have lots of questions. Can it work with low levels? How can I give low level students silent input? What language areas? It's really interesting to have 0% teacher talking time and 100% student talking time. But how can I have 0% teacher talking time when I'm introducing new language? How can I speak without speaking? OK, what about practice? Can I use it to practice the new language, or is it just to present? And if it's all about speaking, what about writing? How can I move from speaking to writing? Will the students be able to write, or it's just for speaking? And what about their feedback? I was really worried whether students are going to like it or no. And if, if they didn't like it, it means that my whole class will be ruined from the first minute. So I was really very nervous about trying it, and especially about how students are going to, to take it or to accept it in class. And I had more challenges in the next slide that my class was considered a big class. Yes, I had only 20 students, which is not a big class at all, but um, I actually, having 20 students for a silent way lesson is too big. Okay? Yeah, Nina, uh, sorry because I'm not following really that chat because I have the slides on my computer and I'm talking on my <laughs> mobile phone, so sorry for not following that chat regularly. Okay, so 20 students is a normal fine class, but for the silent way method, it's not that good because in a silent way lesson, you have to sit and have the students sitting in a circle around you. So how can I manage 20 students sitting in a circle around me so that they all can have access to the materials I have and can see me well? I also had different age groups. My students in this class for the first time, I had students ranging from 18 to 60 year old students. They have different interests, nationalities. I had Egyptian, Syrian, Saudi, Chinese, Romanian. So again, different languages, different learning styles. Can I manage this? These are challenges. So I decided to get out of my comfort zone and go for it and see what will happen. So the initial steps I had is that I have done lots of reading. So, and I have also watched lots of online videos of silent way lessons. Because I couldn't imagine how will a silent way lesson be. If you just read, you will never be able to imagine how can you have a silent way lesson. You have to really watch videos. And there are very good videos of silent way lessons. So I kept watching and watching and watching lots of videos of silent way lessons. And I played with the Cuisinart rods a lot. Every day I go to work, whenever I have a break, I just take out this box of cuisinar rods and put it on my desk and keep playing 
and putting them up and down and trying to put them in different orders. Try to see if I can teach using them, if I can teach meaning or form or pronunciation or colors or whatever. So I played a lot with them. And I have chosen the level um, I'm going to apply this lesson to and the language area. And I kept practicing, practicing, practicing. I kept miming and using gestures and the rods and the pictures and everything and standing in front of the mirror and, yeah, trying it and trying miming and gestures and mouthing words instead of saying them. So I've done everything to practice this new method for me. And a key point I, I also was keen to have is to have some observers. So I invited some of my uh, colleagues to come and observe me. And actually, they were excited about coming and seeing what's going to happen in this class because I wanted someone to observe. I wanted another eye because I couldn't see myself and the students. So I asked them to ju just take notes of what I do and what the students do, just like record what happens, what's going on in the class. And they were very, very friendly and supportive. They came to my class and they took notes, or not taking notes, they recorded everything that was going on in class. Because it's when I read it later, it's like I can see what's going on in class myself. So now going to my lesson. So I'll take you through the lesson. Uh, my language focus was have got and has got, affirmative, negative, and short forms. Why? Because my students pay too much attention to grammatical rules. Whenever we teach a grammar, grammar lesson, they want the rules, and they don't care about how to use this grammatical uh, point uh, or what's the meaning of it. And they also care about the meaning of every single word rather than chunks of language. So they tell me, what's the meaning of have? What's the meaning of got? So they don't accept to have the meaning of a chunk of language. No, we want the meaning of every single word, which is actually limiting their, their language. So I wanted to get them out of this limitation. So the materials I used in the next slide, we have the Cuisinart rods. I used Fidel word charts, the word chart, the charts I showed you, flashcards, and myself, because I, I am the main source of miming and gesturing and keeping things going on. So the next slide, unfortunately, it, um, because here in any minute we can't um, have the animation. So I wanted to show you that in the silent way, we should build from the known to the unknown, because the students should feel comfortable at the beginning that they know something. And from the known, you take them to the unknown. So I started. Uh, um, we had the previous lesson, we had uh, the singular and the plural, and they have learned lots of vocabulary. So I started with this vocabulary. So as you can see, I show them a picture of a watch, and they say, a watch. Good. So I don't write. I just put one small rod representing a, and another rod rep representing watch. And I point to them and to the picture, and students keep repeating, a watch. And then I move on. The next slide, I show them another picture, like an umbrella. And they say, an umbrella. And I keep the same rods. And I point to them, an umbrella. And unconsciously, they get to know that A and an are like one thing. That's an article. Because I don't change the rod. I keep the same rod for A or an. So the students know that that's an article without really saying it. And then I moved to another picture for some, some plural items. So I show them pens. They started saying pens. So I take out the A rod, and I put another rod at the end of the pen rod or the noun rod. So they say pens, and I show them how the S is stuck to the other rod, so that's pens. Okay, and then I show them lots of other pictures. One of them singular, one is plural. We keep moving rods. So I put the A or an, or I put the S. And if they, for example, forget and they say book, so I take, I hold in my hand the small rod of the A or an, so they remember, ah, a book. 
and so on with the singular and the plural. So we keep playing with singular and plural. They were very happy, comfortable, because that's something they know. So we keep practicing and practicing. Then going to the new lesson, have got. I start pointing at myself, and they say, I. So I put one rod on the table. And then, because have got is new language for them, I cannot elicit it. So I point to the word have and the word got in the word chart, which is on the board behind me. So I point to have, I point to got, and I mime that it's mine, it's I have got, and I put the two rods. And then I show again a watch, and I put the a rod and the watch rod. So up till now, there is no writing. I am just mining, showing pictures, and putting the rods. And they are actually reading the rods. They are saying the right sentence that represents these rods. So this is the positive form. And we keep practicing. I change I. I point to the whole class and me among them. So we say we. Or I point to only a group of them, and we say they. And I change the object. Yes, so this slide you can see is I'm moving to the short form. So I take the I and, I and the have rod and I stick them together. And then I elicit from the students. So they say I have. Of course, they can't say it accurately. And at this point, I interfere and I mouth it. So I just say it silently with my mouth. I have, I have. And with my hands, with my fingers, I show them how we stick them together and how we pronounce them. Until one of them manage or succeeds to say it correctly, and I point to him, ask the other students to repeat or to keep saying it, and I ask different students to model it again and again and again, and again we keep practicing and practicing. Then we move to the negative. And here, I just add a point where I mime the not part. So with my hand or with my fingers, I just shake it and show no. So they say, I have not. And if they said no at this point, I have no got, I can go back to the word chart and point to the word not. So I have not got a watch. And we practice again, change I to we or they, change watch to plural or singular with the pictures I have. Then the next slide, as you can expect, I will join have and not and show them haven't. Okay? So that's the difference. It's very important to show them how that we, with the um, positive form, we use I have, but with the negative form, we use I haven't. So which two words that we join together? is shown through the rods. So they can really get it quickly that, ah, yeah. So with the positive, we say, I have. With the negative, we say, haven't. So it's very easy for them when they see how we match, how we join those two parts to make one sentence or to make one form. Then, before moving to the next slide, how do you expect me to introduce uh, the third singular, third person, sorry? So he or she, instead of the first one, which is pointing at myself, what can I do to introduce he or she? Can you? Uh, yes, of course, I will have to add a uh, um, point. Point to who? To yes, if I pointed to to someone, yes, but if I pointed to some to one student. They might exactly point to a girl, but they might say you, because I'm pointing to someone. And I have to hear mime again, show them the hair, or like um, put my hand on mime a moustache or something. So they start, yeah, they start saying, ah, he or she. Yes, and you're saying using a different rod. Do you think I should use a different rod? Why yes or why no? Yes? OK, you're saying yes. Actually, I use the same rod because, as you can see in the next slide, because I wanted them to 
know that this is the same function in the sentence. It's the personal pronoun. It's the subject of the sentence. So I didn't want to change the rod because it means changing their concept of the function of this word in the sentence. So th this was really important that I don't change uh, the colors or the rods because changing the rods means that the students will start to relate this rod and color and size to something new. So I shouldn't do it, do it very often. So I just do it when it's really needed. So I kept the same rod for he, and I just changed the rod for have, and not really changed it. I added above it another one, because it's another version of have. It's has, OK? So and here, I, of course, pointed at the, uh, the word chart, and I elicited has, got, bags. So students now knew that he has, not have. And we kept practicing with. Uh, why above it and not to the right? Actually, you can use even a different uh, um, rod, not even the same one if you want. So one for have and one for has. But I wanted to keep it again to keep students thinking of it. You can put it in front of it or whatever. I just this is how I I did it. Um, and then I kept got of course the same bags the same. I just changed the he and she. Uh, the next one, as you can expect, I put he is. I joined them. So quickly, students could understand, ah, you mean he is. So that's the short. So it was very easy after we practiced that in, in I have to elicit it in he is. So they could get it quickly. And when I added the not, they said, ah, he hasn't. And then so they were very quick later with joining the or doing the short form uh, words. Then I moved to the practice. And I wanted to keep using the same materials or the same, like, let's say, theme in my practice. So I gave each pair of students. I put them in pairs, and I gave each pair a set of Cuisinart rods and a set of flashcards. And let's say student A, one of them, forms a sentence with the rods, and the other one says it. So one student put the rods, and the other one says the sentence, ah, yes, correct. And of course, I asked them to, um, to come out before I start this activity. I asked one of them to come out and act like, like the teacher. So one student came and stood in my table, and she put the rods and started asking the other students. So it's like modeling what they will do with each other. And it worked perfectly well, and they were happy with it, and they liked uh, playing with the rods. Actually, this is not just visual, it's kinesthetic as well. And they loved playing with the rods. The 18-year-old ones and the 60-year-old ones, they all loved playing with the rods and putting them to make up sentences. I wanted to move on to a um, more communicative, more authentic practice. So I opened my bag. I got out some objects from the bag. And I started miming or eliciting from the students. So they started saying, ah, you have got a mobile phone. Or some of them said, she has got, pointing at me, which was perfect. And again, whenever they forget a before the singular item, I point to the small rods. And they remember, ah, a mobile phone. And so on. I got out lots of items from my bag. And they started forming sentences sentences easily. And then I asked them to do the same with each other. So again, back to their partners. They get out some items. They have pens, pencils, books, whatever. They don't have to get out everything in their bags. And they yeah, kept saying, ah, you have got, you have got, you have got. And then I asked them to report about their partners. And here I wanted to test if they are going to convert the pronoun or no. And they actually did it. Um, naturally, and they, they never struggled with it, which was really interesting. So they said, ah, she has got a mobile phone. Uh, he has got uh, two books, or whatever. So they could easily convert the pronouns from first uh, person to third person 
which was very good, which means that they, they really could get the point and they could easily convert the pronoun and the verb as well. Then I asked them for their feedback, so, and I actually wanted them to give good, useful feedback. So I told them, write your feedback about this lesson in your own mother tongue, because these were, let's say, A1 level students, elementary students, so if I ask them to write it in English, they will just write, it was God, good, it was nice, it was not good, or it was not nice, and they will not say anything more than this, which doesn't mean anything to, to, to me as feedback. So I told them, be free, write in your own mother tongue, Arabic, Chinese, Romanian, and I try to manage and translate it. And it was, um, I think it was a good decision because the way they expressed it in their mother tongue was very good and it really told me lots of things and I translated them here to you. So one of them said, now at last I understand the meaning of God. And I actually went to this student and I told, I told her, do you really understand the meaning of God? So she said yes and I said how because um, I didn't really uh, get how she, she now can get the meaning of get. But she explained to me, because I was thinking of the meaning of God, but now I know the meaning of have got. And I was like, wow, yes, that's it. So they could get the meaning of the chunk of language, not just get alone or got alone. Some others said it was very clear, enjoyable, we liked it. And they asked me to do it in all lessons. And he even said in Arabic that now we know the difference between the pronoun, the verb, and so on. They could express these terms in their language, which they didn't know, of course, in English. They didn't really know the noun, pronoun, and so on. But when they expressed it in their um, native language or in their mother language, they really said it. So, and that's the aim, to get them to know or to differentiate the different parts of speech. Some of the observations I had um, is that students related the rod to the word function. So sometimes they told me, oh, please miss, I want the A rod. I want the got rod, which was interesting. So they related it to the function or to the, to the word. Sometimes they said, I want the article rod. And what, they could elicit the rules. One of the students told me, OK, so please, teacher. Stop. So, you mean, I, we, they have got. He, she has got. And I told him, good. So, some students still needed the rules, and they elicited the rules themselves, which is fine. So, it's not the teacher who's saying the rules, but some of them needed it, so they said it. And some others were keen to write down notes. So, I told them, just forget about everything in front of you and look at me. But still, some of them needed to take down notes, to write down the sentences they said, which is um, the nature of some students and uh, the nature of their learning style. They need to write down things. And they also could convert the first and the third person pronouns, which we said. And then I asked them to come out to the board and write down what they have learned. And they could actually write down accurate written forms. So they could write, I have got. And they could write even the short forms accurately without giving them any written model, which was really good, I think, that they could get out the written form because it was all the time just speaking. We were just speaking. We didn't write anything. So I wanted to experiment and see if they can write down after just trying to speak. And they did it. Uh, another interesting point is that weak students were actively engaged. And they were very happy. And I believe because the teacher didn't interfere and because I didn't correct any mistake, it's the students who could correct the mistakes. So whenever one of these weak students said something wrong, I don't comment. Other students comment. Other students correct him. So he feels more relaxed that the correction is coming from other students, not from the teacher, which is really motivating for weak students. So they were very relaxed and they were participating and they don't fear um, 
any kind of uh, prohibition from the teacher or, or whatever. Another interesting point is that one, pa one pair of students put the rods from the right to the left. You know, in Arabic, we write from the right to the left. And those students whose mother language is Arabic, they put the rods, I have got a watch, from the right to the left. Okay? And they pointed to them from the right to the left, but they said them correctly, I have got a watch. And I actually told them, is this the sentence? They kept saying yes. And they are producing accurate uh, sentences, but actually it's in front of them from the right to the left. And I believe because um, they think or they know that in Arabic it's from the right to the, to the left, this is meaningful or this is fine and correct to them. And then when I pointed to the rods in front of them again and again, they said, ah, 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 yeah, yeah, not from the right to the left. And they started putting them, reordering again from the left to the right, which was interesting how the, the mother language interferes in learning and how it has a role even if you are teaching uh, another language. But the mother language will always be there interfering in their learning. Um, some new lessons for me as a teacher is that I can be silent and alert students to work independently. I don't have to say everything in class. I have to be silent a bit and give them time to learn by themselves. And there are various ways of addressing visual learners, not just pictures, flashcards. No, there are colors, sizes, gestures rods, materials, the material of, of, of an object you use can be used. So all these are things that we can use to address visual and of course kinesthetic learners. And also trial and error. So students were trying and they make mistakes and their peers correct and then they get the right form. So they keep trying, making errors and being corrected and so on because the teacher is silent. So they will not get the right model easily. So they, ha they will have to make errors, being corrected, and make other errors, and so on. Also, self and peer correction is very important. When they correct each other, when they correct themselves, this is much better than having the teacher correct them. So since I tried this lesson, I tried to stop myself correcting my students quickly or on the spot. I try to give them more time to self-correct each other or to self-correct themselves and to make errors. And I was like calmer, more comfortable with the students' errors because I know that this is a step to learning something new. So that's one point. But still we have some limitations for the, um, the silent way. Though it looks like student-centered, it's mainly dominated by the teacher because the teacher decides what, what's the language they are going to learn and how they are going to learn it and they can't deviate. They can't go to something else or learn something else. So though it looks like student-centered, but it's actually dominated by the teacher. Uh, it's time-consuming because it takes a lot of time to get the students to produce an accurate form when you can just tell them this form in a second then they get it. So they keep making errors and being corrected and making errors and being corrected until they get the correct form. When it's, uh, let's say, less time consuming if you just tell them the correct form and they get it. Yes, exactly. They get it but they don't use it. Exactly. When they make lots of errors, and they are being corrected, they never forget this form. Of course, and I, another point is that they don't have exposure to a perfect model from the teacher. So it went well in my class because I was just introducing form, but when you're doing the silent way with pronunciation, it's a bit difficult because they have to listen to a perfect model. So that's another point. Again, large classes. In my class, the 20 students, I tried to, to make a U-shaped folder with the tables and the chairs, but still it was a, a big number. Still they were not that comfortable. 
So that's not really good. So let's say like a maximum of 10 students is like a perfect class for a silent way method. Yes, exactly, exactly, Nina. I had tables and chairs, but still it was big because if you make a U-shape for 20 students and you are in the middle, not all of them are comfortably um, watching you. Um, so I ended up with more questions out of this experience. How long should a teacher be silent? So should I break this silence? And I tried the silent way another time with the same uh, class of students. And I got out that, um, an answer to this question, which is that I should break the silence. I shouldn't like um, get them to stay and listen to me for more than, let's say, 20 minutes is the maximum for a teacher to be completely silent, no more than, that, than this. Because it, the students are very alert when you are silent, because they are watching you, concentrating on every facial expression you have and every uh, item you are holding in your hand and everything, and this is too much concentration. And you have to break the silence, either by speaking a bit or getting them involved into an activity. Yeah, they need a break. And even the teacher, so the first time I tried it and I was silent for long, once I started speaking, I felt like my voice is echoing. And everyone in the class were like cheering. Hey, at last you, you're talking. And so I should break the silence. Get them to do an activity. Get them to do anything to break this concentration or alertness. And another question, what about higher levels or different language areas? Can I try it with higher levels or, or no? Can I try it with different language areas? So I tried it with grammar. Can it work with meaning or with vocabulary? Actually, some people used it with vocabulary introducing uh, the names of rooms and furniture in the house. So they build a house with the rods, and then they start to divide the house into rooms and, and so on to introduce vocabulary. But can I use it to uh, teach skills? So I don't think so. So is it just limited to grammar or structure and pronunciation? Can it be used with other language areas, other higher levels? I discovered that it's perfect with lower levels because um, they, they, are, they needed this kind of engagement and they needed to feel that they are learning on their own. And it solved lots of questions that they were asking. And it, it got them a step uh, higher learning the chunks of languages rather than just every single word alone. So do you have any other questions that you think are interesting? So I'll keep this slide. And I can now look at the chat and see if you have any other questions that we can go on and experiment with. And, and that's why I started and I, I, I'm ending the next slide with to be silent or not to be, to be or not to be, yes, and how long should you be silent? So that's my experience with the silent way. And this is what I have learned. It actually affected my teaching a lot in, in lots of, of ways, how to deal with students, how to um, consider learner autonomy, uh, students' responsibility for their own learning, uh, the teacher's um, role in the classroom, uh, how long should you be teaching, how long should you be exposing the students to the language, what should you really be doing in class, just giving them input or helping them. So it's just facilitating their learning rather than just giving them, supplying them with the language. Uh, yeah, OK. Yes, Nina. So how, how it, it changed my teaching. Um, I gave the students, I tried to stop myself speaking in class a lot. So because this is something like, this is a concept we had, ah, low level learners. So the teacher has to be speaking all the time. And the students has, have to be like um, receiving what the teacher says. And I, at this time, and I, I actually like teaching low level learners. 
So I had lots of classes, elementary and pre-elementary students. I just tried to, to stop myself speaking and try to listen to them more. And whenever they make errors, I try to remind myself that this is good. That's a good sign. And I try to encourage other students to correct rather than just rushing out with the answer. So I use whenever I hear anything wrong or a mistake, I just try to correct it, especially when I like don't have time. Or I, But I stop myself doing it. I try to train myself to stop because I could see the results. I could see it when, when students are given a chance to, to make mistakes and to be corrected. And I could see how even the weak ones are getting better when they are corrected by their peers, not by the teacher. So it has changed um, my practice inside the classroom because I became, uh, my classes, let's say, became less uh, teacher-centered. I tried to listen more to the students. I tried to give them a chance to make mistakes. I was more comfortable with their mistakes than before. Yeah, thank you. So any other questions? I'm sorry I couldn't follow that chat before. Uh, yeah, the teaching aids. So the teaching aids, I had uh, the pictures. You can use any flashcards, or you can just use the pictures from their course book and um, like make uh, copies of them or uh, put them on your projector, whatever. Uh, the quizzes are rods. Yes, we have them in our teaching center, and that's, uh, we are lucky to have them, though they were like deserted uh, for long. Um, the feeder shots are there online. You can just show them on, on the board. I showed them on the board, and I had the cuisine rods with me in class. And the pictures, they were just flashcards of their uh, course book. Uh, how appropriate could is I, the silent way regarding the teaching of metacognitive could, skills, could, could learning, I, and communicative? OK. Yeah, thank you so much for the question, Benjamin. Yes. Um, it's not the perfect method for communicative teaching or communicative um, uh, classes. Because it's actually more for, let's say, form, structure, and these kinds of, of stuff that are. So that's why it's, it's a bit limited. And that's what I, I actually found in the, in the research as well, written about it. That it's, that's why it's a bit limited. But I think, from my experience, that we can use it to have the students talk to each other. So when I personalized it and had the students talk about their own items or what they have in their bags and so on. So you can just expand it a bit to make it a bit communicative, but not so much. So it's not like the perfect method to have um, a communicative class. But you can just adapt it a bit to have them to talk about themselves, about their experiences maybe a bit, but not that much. But still, I believe that um, teachers are very good to find a way out of it. So maybe if you practice it more and I practice it more, we might find another way. Exactly, Nina. It's a, it's a great way to, to spend part of a class. And it will be very helpful to spend, again, part, and let's underline part of a class, yes. Exactly, exactly, yes. My class, my class was two hours and a half, so it was too long, and I just tried it in the first half of the classroom, so it was only the first hour. My silence was for 20, 25 minutes, and the other 25 minutes were for practice and other activities, and that's it. The second half of the class, we did something, ex something else, something different. So while we were waiting for you to... Yes, uh, while we were waiting for you to get set up, uh, some, uh, I asked the people here if anyone had seen Colin, uh, Colin Cateno demonstrate the silent way. You know, one of these guys that he died in 1988. And, um, but I saw him demonstrate it at TESOL conferences, and also uh, Glennis and um, Roz, Glennis and Roz, both have seen him. I wonder if they have any. 
Um, interestingly, too, you asked, for example, how long should you keep the silence? Well, I didn't see him do this for 20 minutes, but certainly he pro he, he was very good at being silent and eliciting uh, from students, um, you know, in the demonstrations he set up. So I don't know if they have any. Those are. It's interesting when someone has seen the master, I suppose. You know, actually do the technique. Uh, Glennis and Roz, do you have any comments or any observations you'd like to make based on your experience having seen this? Well, <clears throat> I've been using the silent way for a long time. It's interesting that I got into it very much the way <clears throat> uh, I had described. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Ah, the, um, I mean, I got into it very slowly, and at first, like, uh, I mean, 20 minutes seemed, of uh, being silent seemed a long time, and I only thought of a few things to do with um, rods, and just little by little, I got more into it, and and I ended up just doing only that, <laughs> all levels, not, but not, but, not always. I mean, ro the Russian charts are what people notice, but um, it's what I had said. It's about make, getting people to be uh, take responsibility for their own learning, and you can do that with any ma any materials, written or whatever you, whatever you, you, the objective happens to be. I have been using the silent way for a long time too. I got into it in 1971 and uh, because I saw Gatenyo teach a, a one hour Chinese class and it just blew me away completely and uh, I knew that I wanted to be able to teach like that and so I got into the silent way in 1971 and it took me quite a long time to get a handle on it because there was nobody else doing it around me at the time and uh, I use it now for uh, all levels and you can use it with big classes let me reassure you I've used it with classes of 40 uh, many times in Japan in particular and other places um, and with the bigger classes than that even it is quite possible to do it um, and I use it for both English and French and um, the rectangle chart that you used is, is a very, very old one. It's been updated, and uh, so you'd probably find it a much better thing to use. It, it now has become a very good map, whereas that one is just, uh, um, it's just an inventory of the sounds, if you like. And uh, so I find, yes, it's, it's, I can see somebody's asking, how do, how do I ensure that everyone could see the rods? Well, the rods, if you put them into the lid of the box and then you just send the box around the classroom and people ask each other and uh, they are very attentive to the answers that uh, the ones and the others give and uh, yeah so how you use it with advanced levels oh Glenis has said I blue tack them to the board yes that's right you do too <laughs> um, the the uh, ad with advanced classes, what I do is I get the class to talk about. There's one rule in the class, and the rule is people have to. They are only allowed to say the truth, and the, the truth can be anything. So I would launch, say, a very open question like, "What did you do last weekend?" And the students have to just ask each other the question and answer it with what they actually did last weekend and this can go on for ages and that would be a very good way if, if I decide let's uh, let's work on how you talk in the past well then I have an open question like that and the students just ask each other questions answer the questions and they get into a conversation the same as you would do in a cafe and uh, my role in it is just to launch the first question and then correct as we go along, which I do using thinker corrections. Oh, really interesting. Thank you so much for sa for sharing your experience, your long experience. So I just have a very, very small, little, tiny, modest experience with the silent way. So thank you for allowing me to share it with with you, with such a big experience you have with the silent way and you're very lucky to have seen Caleb doing it and some people doing it. 
and I'm really learning a lot from you now. Thank you so much for these ideas. So I'll definitely try it with other classes with other levels. And I, I advise everyone, um, so if you would like to really try the silent way and be silent for some time and use the rods and these stuff, to try to record yourself, um, video record yourself. I really wanted to do this because when I watched these online videos of, of silent way classes, I really wished I could record myself so, so I could watch it later and really see what was going on in class and the students' faces and at what point they, they, they uh, were, they felt bored or at what point they felt engaged and, and so on. So it, it was really, really important. So I hope that the next time I do it, I, I video record myself so that I can watch it and learn more by watching myself again. Thank you so much. So we, we are going, if you have any questions, now you can ask the experts we have here. You know, we're, we'll blog this at learningtogether.net, and of course, this is what learning together is all about. It's, uh, we learn from Ayat and, and her experience because actually, your experience is very significant. Um, so some of us who've used the silent way before or seen it, you know, this is a long time ago. This is uh, uh, 30 years ago. So that's uh, it, it's it's really nice that you've revived it. And uh, you know that you've taken it on as if it's a new thing because that refreshes it, and you explained very clearly how it works for you. Um, I was going to say though that since I do blog this at learningtogether.net, if you do produce a video, we can add it to the blog post, so that would be very interesting. So don't feel that you yeah. have to stop here. You can provide more information if you like, and we can put it at the post learningtogether.net. Yeah, actually, Vance, I, I want to take from your words. When I when I first thought about the silent way, some people just told me, "Oh, the silent way that, that's an old thing to try out in class. It will not work. It won't be interesting. Why don't you try a communicative approach, uh, uh, whatever?" And there were lots of other approaches as well. And this point is what made me um, try it out. So. So I think that there is nothing called a dead approach or a dead method. We can keep like bringing these methods back to life again and back to our classrooms, and we can always learn from them. Yeah, it, it could be something very modern. I mean, I can envisage a uh, an iPad app or an Android app, you know, a Cuisinier rods that you could uh, manipulate in a space so you wouldn't have to blue tack your rods to the board. Uh, the, Students could see them on their mobiles or on their iPads. You could put them in a, uh, a common space. So that's that's one point. Another uh, very interesting bit of software over the decades since the Silent Way was uh, was started is uh, Rosetta Stone, which has uh, always been of interest to me. The idea that you can develop language by showing pictures and eliciting uh, it's a kind of a Silent Way. Uh, you know, using pictures to elicit language, and that's uh, supposed to be effective. I don't. Uh, anyway, I've, I've yeah. tried it with. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the game you reminded me of something. Now, whenever I find my students in the break, uh, they are all holding one iPad or mobile phone, and they are all of them opening one game, and they are playing it or trying to guess it together, which is going viral now everywhere, which is guess what game. And this just gives them two pictures or three pictures, and they form some words from these pictures in English. And so they, they are doing it. They are playing with pictures and making up words. And sometimes it's not just um, a direct word. They just have to think about it and to think what this picture might mean with the other picture. Together, they might give a different meaning. So they are already playing it with this game nowadays, guess what game, which everybody is playing online and sharing on Facebook and, and so on. So that's another way of doing it. That's another way of how, when you have pictures, you can turn these pictures into words and the words into language and, and, and so on. So they are enjoying it. They are enjoying this visual aspect of, of the game. I think the game. I think the game is called Guess What. Ah, That's what I understand. Okay. 
Ah, oh, oh, okay, that could be. All right. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> it sounded the way uh, it will come out on the recording as you're uh, teasing us with what game it could be. Okay. So guess what? We'll look up that. Uh, those of you who provided links in the chat, for example, we just got eslexpose.info from Glennis. Um, I've opened them in my browser, and I'll put them in the show notes at learningtogether.net. So uh, if there are any more questions, feel free to ask them. Otherwise, we might let Ayat get back to her day. I've got to congratulate you, Ayat. Uh, well, first of all, I, I met Ayat for the first time. We've um, been collaborating online for some time. And she's also collaborated quite closely with Maria Bossa and in the webheads, uh, what we might call the webhead sphere. Uh, so they had a, Maria went to Egypt and visited Ayat there. And then Ayat came to uh, Peace Al Arabia conference in Dubai uh, just a month ago. And we met there. And that's where she agreed to give this talk. So it's, thank you very much. Uh, I should say that we try to do one of these every week. Uh, we don't actually have any lined up for the future. Uh, so next week, if someone would like to uh, lead a discussion or present to us or uh, whatever, uh, we're open. I'll, I'll start trying to you know rattle the bushes, shake the trees, and try to find a presenter for next week. Oh, it could be me if you know, all else fails. So, um, Anyway, and please consider sharing with us and learning together. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we all learn from any time anyone shares experiences. We all learn quite a lot from it, as we've just seen. OK, and that last link was to guess what? OK. Any other questions? Oh, we have Ayat here. And I also wanted to say it's great the way you made the technology work in the end. Uh, that was quite. Uh, multiliterate of you. So that was a good job. Thank you so much, Ben. Yes, this is what we have learned, that technology doesn't always work and that we should never give up. This is what I have learned from you and from all webheads. So thank you, everybody, for coming. It's, it's an honor and a pleasure that you came to listen to me and that you shared your experience as well. And I invite everyone, so I know that some people are here maybe for the first time at Learning Together. Whatever you, we do in class um, can benefit others, I, I, I'm sure of it. So whatever you have done in class, whatever experience you would like to share, you just come and share it at Learning Together. And I know Vance is always welcoming everyone. Thank you so much.